Okay. Hey everybody, welcome to the Big Book Workshop. As we just said, this is not your traditional meeting, um, nor is it your traditional Big Book study. Uh, we go into the highlights of the book, uh, we do bounce around a little bit and recap what we've done from last time. A uh, couple rules while we're here. Uh, rule number one is if you have your video on, you must have your clothes on at all time. Uh, if you don't have your clothes on, your video can't be on. And rule number two is if you are acting inappropriately at any time throughout the meeting, either in the chat or on screen, uh, we will unfortunately have to remove you from the meeting and you won't be allowed back. Uh, but other than that, uh, sit back, relax. Uh, the three of us, myself, uh, Tony and Joe will be facilitating. If you are lost or you have any questions, you can pop them in the chat and uh, we'll try to answer them best we can. Um, uh, is Adam coming or what's up? Adam's got to work till, uh, till seven. He said that. Uh, okay. So there may be someone named Adam helping us as well, but uh, yeah. So we're going to start with the set aside prayer, Joe. Yeah, and uh, hey everybody, again, Joe, Recovered Alcoholic. How we open up this meeting, and I'm going to give a little description of why this is important. Uh, the set-aside prayer is to help you have a better experience with with not only the solution, but the ideas and principles we're about to implement and talk about today during the Big Book study there. W whatever you're coming in with, we ask that you remove that through this prayer right now so you can have a new experience, and it goes a little something like this. Dear God, please set aside everything I think I know, I know about myself, about this book, about my illness, these steps, and especially about you, dear God, so that I might have an open mind and a new experience with all these things. Please help me to see the truth. And let's get rocking. Right on. I'm a recovered alcoholic. My name's Tony. It's Friday, April 8, 1989. Welcome. Good to see everybody here today. Beautiful day out. Things are looking better. Um, last week we finished off with 6 and 7 on page 76. To recap, uh, we, we realized what the, the whole purpose of this thing is, is not only to learn the mechanics of it, is but to have an experience. What type of experience? A psychic change or spiritual experience as the result of our relationship with a power greater than ourself. Where and how were we to find this power? Well, that's what this book is about. We found out what our dilemma was was lack of power, right? And so what we had to find was power. Well, where and how were we to find this power? That's exactly what this book is about. So his main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will, which will solve your problem or help you solve your problem. We think it says, which will help us solve our problem. It actually says, which will solve our problem, right? Because alcoholism is beyond our pay grade. Our three pertinent ideas say before and after alcoholism, we're unable to we're unable to un, to deal with it, right? It's beyond our pay grade. So what we need to find is a solution that kind of eliminates that that problem. So we we find out on seventy six we re, we emphasize this prayer. Why don't we start from here, and why don't we just start from the if part on page seventy six to recap what we've done and it'll lead us into where we're going. If we can answer to our satisfaction, then we look back at set six. We have emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Are we now ready to let God remove from us all of the things which we have admitted are objectionable? And we went through that in great detail last week. You should have a good understanding what those things are, right? Can he now take them all, every one? If we still cling to something, we will not let go. We ask God to help us be willing. So the, those things that still have emotional deformities or attachments or resentments or a narrating story in our minds or our experience, things that we're still stuck to in the past or things we're afraid of in the future. Anybody still have those things? So, we, so it's just about acknowledging those things, right? And the second part of that will bring us into what we do with that, right? When ready, we say something like this. My creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defective character, 
which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. So when it stands in the, the way of my usefulness to my fellows, when does that happen? That's in the moment, right? So we, we see we still have a revolving, the human condition. We're still plagued with the human condition. Anybody find that surprising here? How many people thought when you did the steps you'd be exempt from the human condition? That you would never be plagued with you again? But as we see that this is actually a recipe for people like ourselves and anybody willing to pursue the spiritual remedy to the human dilemma. That's why there's so many 12-step fellowships. How many fellowships are there using the same recipe because we find a solution for the dilemma called self, right? Okay. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. So what's the most important, what are we asking for here? To remove the things that allow me to be useful. And the most important is strength, power. To allow me to stay on, on the course of action that I deem necessary to find relief from the life that I was living. We have two alternatives, a spiritual way of life or to go on to the bitter end. And that kind of fluctuates because a lot of us get uh, feeling better and then we start resting on our laurels. We start, anybody here ever start getting feeling better and start relaxing a bit and then the pain comes back? I mean, you show up. Anybody ever notice that, that when you stop working, you start showing up? And when you start showing up, you start having conversations with somebody that don't like you too much, which is yourself, right? And yourself starts talking to you in manners that are, that are unbecoming. You start arguing with yourself. Any arguers here? Anybody get into great debates with themselves here? What's missing from those debates? Is God present in those moments? When you got you stuck on you. And there's no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. So we see that there is some kind of relief when I apply these prayers. How many people realize that kind of experience that there is relief through the application to these prayers and the shifting of my ideas along spiritual lines? How many people get relief from that here? How many people understand it? Nope. You understand how that works? I don't understand how it works. I know it works. It's a phenomenon. Why is it that when I pray to this God or to this thing, I seem to get relief from myself. When I try to create relief, it, I get more problems. It's kind of weird, like just the element of connecting to this power. I get more relief than when I don't connect to this power. I don't fully understand it. Maybe I'll get you guys to explain it to me later, but it's just one of those things. I see it works and I come to rely on it. Do I fully understand how it I don't understand how it works, but I know my life's a lot better when I'm tuned into it than when I'm not tuned into it. Can I really define what it looks like? Mm, not really, but this is what I, how I experience it. This is what it, my life looks like or our lives look like when we're tapped into it. And this is what our lives look like when we're not tapped into it. Well, why can't you create this kind of life when you're not tapped into it? I don't really know. I can't really answer that riddle. Because lack of power is my dilemma. But I kind of understand now when I do these things, my life is a lot better than when I don't do these things. How many people have found that to be true? And we could change how we're at or where we're at or how we feel in the moment. Anybody realize that? All of a sudden we have the recipe now to change instantaneously right now. If we wish to work toward that. Okay? Do you want to add anything to that? Anybody? Joe? Okay. No, go ahead. Okay. We have then completed step seven. That's now good. So, right? completed, what does completed mean? Finished. And what are we reiterating is that God does the works with inside of me sufficient enough that I get relief from me. And, and I'm trusting that he'll remove from me the things that stand in the way of my usefulness. In the moment. What's God's will for me is to play the role he assigns. When? In the here and now. The only moment I'm responsible for is now. When is now ever over? Now, now is now. When's now? What do you mean now? Yeah, now. Now? No. It's always now. No matter how you look at it. It may kind of sound weird, but there's no later. It's now. Well, I could set up bank accounts that pay stuff as they go along, right? That debit system. But all I'm responsible for is the here and now. 
because I can't really do nothing in the future. But if I'm looking after the now, how's my future start going to start looking? Pretty good. How's my past going to start looking? I'm start going to have a past worth, worth talking about. Anybody like that idea? I've been sober long enough that I got a pretty amazing past now. Nothing, you know, I don't mind talking about the other past, but I'm really more happy with the past I'm living now. Okay. Okay. Now we need more action. Without which we find that faith without works is dead. So you notice what they started here that they didn't start in pay on, on six and seven. You notice how they started this conversation, what words they used to start this new conversation with a new idea of something that's being presented here? What did they say in step six? Let's look at it. We then look. Right, we're looking at it. Yeah. Step seven, am I willing? Action. Right? Well, when ready, we said something like this. My creator... It's, it's, it's a reconfirmation. It's, it's just a willingness. There's nothing much I can really do but be willing. There's nothing I can do except prayer and reliance and trust. There's not, nothing more than that prayer of trusting and being willing. Is there any other requirements for me in those two segments? Just that you got to voice it because if it's saying it, then we say it. Voice it. So that, that's it, right? As far as anything else, I'm unable to, to create that change. So here, now they're saying, now we need more action. Yeah. So this is an action step. The other two steps are preparation and reminder steps. It's a reconfiguring uh, or re, the recontract between me and my creator. It's reemphasizing step three in a more positive way. Because now I understand it way better now than I did in step three. Right now I'm starting to have an experience and I understand that based on my spiritual condition will determine the outcome of my day, my life, and my relationships. Right? When I'm absent of this power, my life will start looking more, I will start showing up more. And I already know what it looks like when I show up, right? You already know what it looks like when you show up because that's your fourth and fifth step. Anybody like it when you show up? No. Unsupervised as we like to say? But when you show up supervised, connected, you notice that it's a lot different experience for you and everybody around you. You know, a lot of people talk about the promises. Oh, you know, you'll know when the promises are coming true when the people around you are experiencing them. <laughs> okay, go, go ahead. <laughs> Let's look at steps eight and nine. So what are we doing now? We're looking at it, right? We're going to look at eight and nine. We have a list of all persons we have harmed and to whom we are willing to make amends. We made it when we took inventory. We subjected ourselves to a drastic self-appraisal. It was drastic, wasn't it? It was. Now we go out to our fellows and repair the damage done in the past. We attempt to sweep away the debris which has accumulated out of our effort to live on self-will and run the show ourselves. So, is it because God was present in our lives that all these things happened, or is it the absence of God? Absence. So when people use this acceptance thing, nothing happens in God's world by mistake, we see that's right. Nothing happens by mistake. We see you're the cause of all these things. 100%. God didn't do these things to you. And these things that happened to you wasn't orchestrated by God. It was orchestrated by sick people. It was the absence of God that these things were able to happen. If God was present in these things, would these things have happened? No. So we see in order to have a different story, what needs to be present is my connection with source, life, whatever you want to call it. The life worth, creative intelligence, whatever you made peace with, but that power. Right? And when I have access to that power, I'm, I'm more living on a spiritual basis than an animalistic basis or instinct-based basis. Right? And so I see I caused all of this problems by living on an instinct-based life. And I couldn't help doing what I did. And when I see that, how many people see that now? You couldn't help doing what you did. And those people you involved wasn't personal. You could not 
not involve them. It's just collateral damage. And when you see what you're capable of doing, now you reverse that and look at all the people that did stuff to you. It was really nothing personal. You just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time or the wrong situation. And anybody born in that situation would have had the same experience. It wasn't personal. Pretty wild when you start looking at it that way, right? And the more you understand the things you do, the more you'll understand what the people did to you. So it's kind of really a spiritual axiom there, okay? If we haven't the will to do this, we ask until it comes. Remember, it was agreed at the beginning we would go to any lengths for victory over alcohol. Probably so so there, there's a contract there. Where did we make that contract? How it works. Well, where did we make the contract? Step three. Well, it's, it's kind of like, yeah, right, right. Remember, it says we thought well before taking the step. Yeah. Making sure we could abandon ourselves to this new course of action. We thought well because I know what needs to happen and I need to face something that I've never been willing to face in my entire life. Willing to face me and the things that I've done to make right with me and the world around me. To make peace with me. Right? In order to make peace with me, I need to make peace with the world around me. Right? And I've never had the will or the strength to do that. So when they ask here, if I don't have the willingness to do that, I need to pray to seek power to do that. When I seek power to do that, it gives me the strength to overcome self, to match calamity with serenity. Right? When Remember the fear prayer that they talked about? We begin to outgrow fear. What would stop us from doing some of our amends? Is it fear? Sure. How many people think of, of right away when you did your amends list, or even before you did your fourth step, you thought, I'm not making amends to these people. You go right to the ones that you're not going to do. How many yeah. people went to that? Like those stumbling blocks, right? You're right away to self-asking self. I'm not doing this. I'm doing this. And you start arguing with yourself. Here, here what was suggested with, with uh, my sponsor, and it kind of helped me. It just kind of was you make a list of the ones now you're willing to do, the maybes and the nevers, right? And then you make the emotional ones. And the financial ones. And the ones that are financial, you put a sum beside them all. Of all the ones you owe money to. All the institutions. And the emotional ones with family, friends, and all this other stuff. And some are in the same length. And then you kind of put, yes, I'm willing to make amends to these people. Maybe these people. And no, never these people. And then you have a rough idea of the ones you need to pray for willingness for. Right, Because we only think of one thing at a time. It's not in the book that way, but it's very helpful to have that one where they talk about, right? Because they talk about the ones that we were not willing. So it's kind of suggesting there is kind of like a list, right? Just so you don't go over it in your brain over and over and over. You know how many people like to repeat their thinking here? Over and over. This way you have the list that's taken care of. You could refer back to the list again that we've gotten in step eight. We already have a list, but we're breaking it up more defined now. Is that kind of helpful? Yep. Probably there are still some misgivings. As we look over the list of business acquaintances and friends we have hurt, we may feel diffident about going to some of them on a spiritual basis. Okay, so what are we doing as we look over the list of business friends and acquaintances? So we have a list. We're looking at this stuff. It's more defined. And I don't know if we're more um, um, uh, more crazier nowadays than they were way back then. I guess there was less damage way back then because the circle was a lot less smaller. Now there, we involve a lot more, there's a lot more collateral damage, a lot more moving and relocating, a lot more family, a lot more people who, who kind of, uh, um, what is that called uh, when people kind of cater, not cater, but uh, help you so you don't hit your bottom? Enable. Enable. A lot more people enable you, a lot more people that we use as resources so we don't hit bottom. Remember in Bill's story, when, when the world was falling apart, he was kind of sitting there, probably con contemplating, what am I going to do now? And then he had a friend in Montreal. Remember, he thought, I have a friend in Montreal. He has money. That's the way we think. He has money, and I'm entitled to some of that money. Right? So I'm going to Montreal with my friend who has money. Anybody, when they're bouncing along, finding, ready to find their bottom with inside of themselves, think of that Rolodex in their mind of people, places, and things that they could still... 
find help or that would help them or you'd be able to extort some more money from them? Huh. How many yeah. people have really exhausted their resources? Every single one. Exhausted. We, we, we're, we're, we're an amazing group of people. We can go there with our heart in our hand. We get them looking at us and they feel so bad for us and then we know where we got them and as we leave, we ask them for 20 bucks. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Like we're just yeah, fun. About 20, I'd always ask for 40. 40, yeah. For, well, I got sober way before you, right? So yeah. 20 bucks was a lot of money back then. We're, and we're master manipulators. Any master ma manipulators here? Oh, yeah. I'm exhausted. I've been working all day in the heat, so don't mind me if I'm sounding a little fun. We're funny. See, we got to watch our thinking in our mind. That's why it's so important to have sponsorship as we go through here and counsel. And we got to kind of talk to people before we go do our nines, right? We got to talk to our sponsor that our motives are correct. And we got to get people's permission that we don't show up and Shanghai them. We don't show up out of nowhere and just sabotage. Hey, look. You know, on their doorstep. Hey, it's me. Come here to make amends. We make appointments. We let them know what we're about to do. And the book kind of goes through that. But we're master manipulators. We got to kind of watch that. Because we're the kind of people that we, we know we've done wrong. And we'll get somebody else to apologize for the stuff we've done. Anybody like that here? Anybody ever attempt to tell you of some of the stuff you've done? And then you turn it around where they're actually apologizing to you for the stuff you've done to them? <laughs> We're good. Oh, yeah. Okay. As we look. So no action yet, is there? We're still no. preparing. There's a lot of preparation happening here, right? A lot of people do the race. Now I'm going to go do my nines now. And they start rushing out to do their nines. No, 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 no. Relax. Right? Seek counsel. Okay? Let us be reassured. To some people, we need not and probably should not emphasize the spiritual nature on our first approach. We might prejudice them. At the moment, we are trying to put our lives in order. But this is not an end in itself. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. So a lot of people change the wording of that. You hear a lot of people talking about our real purpose of maximum service to God and the people around us. How many people hear, hear it mentioned like that? Our real purpose is to be of maximum service to God and the people around us. They miss the most important word. Anybody know what the most important word is there? You should have a piece of paper beside you and write down what you think it is on a piece of paper. And then we'll tell you what it is. And then you can kind of go, wow, and kind of readjust your thinking along those lines or kind of expand on, on how the book talks about it. So isn't that interesting that they use this certain terminology? And we've always said it like this, but it's actually said like this. Why would they say it like this and not the way it's been said? So what we here most of the time in meetings is our real purpose is the fit is to be of maximum service to God and the people around us. The actual most important word there is what, Joe? The fit. Fit. It takes effort to fit ourselves. Yeah. To fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God. So they're reiterating the most important part of this whole process. Again, which they talked about in step three, which, which was an idea no, they're re-emphasizing what the whole purpose is. And then you'll see as we go through here, the real design of the book is you read through 8 and 9, you get to 10, and you start practicing 11 and 12 as you go do your 9s. A lot of people say they're in order for a reason. Yeah, we read them in order. But in order to really be effective in this thing, I need to seek counsel with something greater than me, which is step 11. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood. Praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. What was step seven about? Power. What was this willingness? Seeking power. It's all about power. So if I start going to go make amends without having the disciplines of 11, who's showing up when stuff starts, when the calamity starts happening? I'm going to start becoming instinct-based again, 
and in counsel with myself, and I won't have the necessary power to override self. And what happens is I'll go in with the amen on a fear base. It won't come out the way I'm hoping, and then I'll show up again in the middle of the men, and then I'll own owe an amen for the amend. Causing harm again and again, yep. Right? And a lot of us, what we do is what they talk about here is we start on our families. We get a little sober and we start confronting our family, friends, and loved ones about their wrongs and how spiritually we've become. I'm living on a spiritual basis now. Ain't I wonderful? I got three months again. And really, you should be living the way I'm living because I've seen the light. And, and you know, I'm, I'm sorry about the last 15 years, but I'm here to help you now that I've got three months. I'm here to help you reconstruct your life because if your life wasn't the way it was, then my life wouldn't be the way it is. So let's work on you now. <laughs> Nobody in this group, right? Nobody? Anybody, how many people read page 62, here 63, and thought about somebody else that it applied to? self self center. you read that page, oh, I'm going to leave this whole open for my girlfriend to read. When I first read those, I said, oh, because she's so like that. Oh, no wonder I have problems in my life. Look at the people I'm surrounded by. Oh, i got so much work ahead of me. Anybody? That's what they're talking about. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Easy here. Easy. Let's lighten up here. Remember, right? Remember, we're just out of the gate here. It's like when we go to meetings, a lot of us, we look at these people that have been around a while and go, I can't believe these people. Yeah, remember, these people were here to greet you when you were out there. Remember, these people have been leaving the lights on. These people have been making coffee. These people have been putting on the Zoom meetings. These people that you don't seem to like so much will be the people that save your life. So easy on everybody around you. So my sponsor taught me, he says, the best way to approach those who 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 uh, um, owe you an amend is to think about how those that owe that you owe an amen, how you'd like them to be treated. How you treat others is how the same way those are going to treat you. It's like, it's kind of like, the best way to describe it is, this guy owes me 200 bucks, and I give him a lot of grief because he owes me 200 bucks, but I owe this other guy 600 bucks, and I want him to be kind, considerate, and thoughtful to me, right? But yet, the people I owe money to, I mean, I mean, the people that owe me money. Do you, do, am I kind of emphasizing, am I explaining that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So to fit ourselves to be of maximum uh, service to God and the people about us. I had way too much sun today. I'm a little burnt. Okay, go ahead. It is seldom wise to approach an individual who still smarts from our injustice to him and announce that we have gone religious. In the prize ring, this would be called leading with the chin. Why lay ourselves open to be branded fanatics or religious bores? We may kill a future opportunity to carry a beneficial message. But our man is sure to be impressed with a sincere desire to set right the wrong. He is going to be more interested in a demonstration of goodwill then our talk of spiritual discovery. Okay, so we're going to back this up. We're going to look at this entirely differently than most of us have ever looked at this. We think step nines are about us. A lot of us think about step nines are about clean my past, make right. But So if we back up here, they talk about here, we may kill a future opportunity to carry a beneficial message. So what's, what's our real purpose? To fit ourselves, to be of maximum service to God and the people around us. So when, we, when new people come into the fellowship and they hear what we used to be like, and they see what we're like now, and they hear what made this possible, this transition of this new experience that these people are having was this course of action through a spiritual basis. And if you want what we have, so what we are now is demonstrations of something greater than ourselves working in our lives. 
right? So when these people see us and the transformation that happens in our lives, we may be, we're carrying more than just a message of, hey, I'm sorry for what I did. We're doing a demonstration of something greater than ourselves working in our lives that this message may in turn help somebody, not only them, but somebody that they know who is suffering or dying from alcoholism or, or drug addiction. Right? Go ahead. And uh, exactly. And one of the things, too, is like a good demonstration. It's like, I, I've done this. I've gone up to people and made amends, talked about how good I was doing this and this, but I didn't come with the money that I owed. Right? And so a demonstration also is coming with what you owe or what you're going to pay back or living by these principles, being an example of what you're actually talking about and kind of leaving all that. Uh, you know, the uh, evangelical, you know, the, the enthusiasm about it, but demonstrating it, right? Because it, it's easy to feel really good after a couple of weeks dry and then go, hey, like, I got such a good life, I'm going to meetings and this, but not really have done this thing, right? So they're talking about how has this, and Tony's alluding to it already, and it'll be alluded later on, is, is, is this an inside thing? Can we actually see it? happening rather than being said right i always tell guys i don't need to hear how good you're doing i can see how good you're doing well and and it's kind of like um like i never caught this because like back when i was getting sober it was always about us me fixing clean sweeping my side of the street that's what they used to say all the time you know it was about making right fixing and making amends it was never really about a demonstration of these things to the people around me or what they're going through or healing for them that they could start kind of healing what's going on in their life that they'll feel safe enough that they could start healing whatever whatever problem or energy bad energy we have between us and so what that kind of looks like is with my mom my mom and I probably I made peace with her quite a while ago that means whenever she bring up something I never brought up the past or talk about it or bring up anything um, uh, to the table again, she, where she would still talk about different things I said or different things I did. And when she talked about those different things that I said or did way back, she's telling me she still has energy and pain around that situation. And she's looking for safety or safe place that she could kind of revisit that so she can have healing, right? And one of the things a lot of the times where they talked about our thinking this is where step 11 gets in. Our thinking will rob us of being of service to fit ourselves to be of service to God and the people around us, not giving them an opportunity to heal. Yeah. Right? And so it's just kind of weird. So that's why you really need to be doing 11 in the morning meditation, seeking counsel. How do I approach this thing? Allowing your in, into it, your intuitiveness that when something comes to the surface, that's what you're supposed to deal with. That God, whoever you want me to make amends to, can you have them show up? Can you have them be a part of this thing? So one of, one of the things that was kind of really interesting is my godmother. So th this is why counsel with another human being, having that list, and step 11 is so important. So years ago... Um, my mom was getting up in age and she can't drive, like she can't uh, take the bus and all that. So I'll go to Ontario and I'll drive her around for three days to go visit all her sisters and her brothers and, and all that other stuff. I stay at home. So we spent three days doing that. And one, one year I went to go visit my godmother. And now I never visit these people for a long period of time because I, n I never thought they liked me too much. I went and made amends in early sobriety and I never really went back because in my mind, they never liked me. They never really liked me. And why why would I subject myself to that? So what I did without realizing it is I created a barrier with with these people. And, and one year, my, my, gut, my grandmother asked me, she says, why don't you come see us? Don't you miss us? And, and that really hit the core of me because I thought they didn't want nothing to do with me. So I talked myself out of that, that relationship. So when I went back and I seen my godmother, she was in an elderly home, and, and I went and seen her. I haven't seen her now, probably at this time was another, it was 10 years since I seen her previous to that. And she seen me, and she lit up, and she was like, oh, like, oh, Tony, come and sit here. So I went and sat down beside her, and she, what she started doing, she started crying, and she started asking me for forgiveness. And I said, you're asking me for forgiveness, which was kind of weird. And she says, yeah, when you were a baby, I had to make a decision to either 
to, to give you back to your parents, to your mom. She says, I didn't want to give you back to your mom. So she felt responsible in a way for how my life turned out. Right. So she was carrying that for at that time. So I'm 58. So 50, 49 years she was carrying this pain inside of her because she was pregnant with twins. And she said, I couldn't feed you both. I had to make a decision to give you back to your mom so I could feed my twins. And she carried that for 49 years. And when I sat and I was able to sit with her and she released that pain of what she was going through. And that means she was able to find peace with it. And I would have robbed her of that st sticking with my own thinking. But when I, when I talk about fitting myself to be a maximum service to God and people around me, that means if an opportunity presents itself, I go if there's no damage. And I don't know why I need to go, but I just go. And th these are usually the indicators why. People will show up and people play. Anybody here have somebody show up in your life when you needed somebody the most? Oh, yeah. So now we become those people. Remember, we're his agents. They talk about that, right? He's the father, we're his children, we're his agents. We, we, we're carrying this message. And a lot of times it's just a demonstration of that and showing up and being a part of, okay? No, I'm not muted. We don't use this as an excuse for shying away from the subject of God when it will serve any good purpose. We are willing to announce our convictions with tact and common sense. The question of how to approach the man we hated will arise. It may be he has done us more harm than we have done him. And though we may have acquired a better attitude toward him, we are still not too keen about admitting our faults. Nevertheless, with a person we dislike, we take the bit in our teeth. Yeah. yeah, if you go to enough meetings, you'll have a couple of those on your list. I tell you. <laughs> oh, never mind the people around you. I had a few of those. Oh my God, they eat your lunch, don't they? These people that you don't like too much, eh? They come into a meeting and they change your energy. You think they change the whole, but your whole energy changes, and they're totally unaware that you're even even dislike them, eh? So. I had a guy like that. Oh my God, he was early, early sobriety. He punched out a couple of people I knew, and and, and oh man, I just wanted, I just wanted to take this guy to task, eh? Like so bad. Like I was losing sleep, and I was thinking I'm gonna meet him in the parking lot and talk to my sponsor. My sponsor said, "No, you need to find peace. You need to pray. You need to kind of take it easy." So I started bad mouthing this guy. My sponsor found out about it. My sponsor says, "Now you got to go make amends." You got to go make amends to all those people you bad mouthing him about and kind of talk about, you know, the gospel. Not You don't tell him or them what you said, that you're just incorrect in doing so, right? And so when I had to approach him to make amends, I said, look, and I was talking shit about you. I did, you know, I shouldn't have. I was wrong about that, eh? And my sponsor said, keep your hands in your pocket and you pray. Right, and I said, I'm not keeping my hands in my pocket. I'll just keep my hands just at the ready. Right, <laughs> so I said, so I, I'm telling this guy. I said, hey, you know, it wasn't very cool. I'm praying. I'm keeping my energy. He goes, I hope so. He says, you, you never really. You always been a bit of an asshole to me, anyways. Right. <laughs> oh my god, I could. I felt the energy come up. Right. I prayed, turned around, and left. Right. And then a year later, I had to make amends to this guy twice. They'll teach you to stop gossiping or saying shit about people is when you have to make amends to them because we hate making amends to people we don't like do we so imagine everybody you gossiped about if you had to make amends to them would you still gossip would you still slander backstab and say shit about people in the fellowship who are also here trying to save their life would you be saying stuff about him her or people around you if you knew it might cost them their life or your life Pretty interesting, right? And so now, this the most done thing in Alcoholics Anonymous and NA and uh, groups is the slander and backstabbing and the two-faced shit we say about people and it's the least apologize for. And there's new people listening to us. When you sit beside somebody and the person behind you and you say your little blah, blah, blah to them, there's a new person sitting behind you listening. I remember I was sitting in a meeting in Toronto and it was the first time I heard this speaker and I thought it was the first time this guy talked about his story and, and the things that were happening. 
And I was just like, wow, like there, there are other people like me. And I heard these two people in front of me go, what, what, a, what an animal that guy is. I can't believe this guy, blah, blah, blah. And then I said, if you feel that way about him, how are you going to feel about me? Right? Right away, my social instinct was warped. I didn't realize that was a few people in AA. That wasn't AA. People who live on a spiritual-based life don't look at people like that. Right? They realize we're all in the same boat, rowing the same way, and I can't afford to throw anybody out of the boat because I don't know the hand that will be pulling me back out of the water for when I slip or when the wave hits so hard and I'm out of the boat. I don't know the hand that will be lifting me back out of the water. And that's what we talked about a fellowship here, right? This is kind of, I'm going to say this story. There's, there's another time I was at a meeting in Toronto and I'm trying to get sober. And, I, and I'm trying to, like, uh, from the background I come from and, and the street and stuff, like that, there was a guy getting a year cake and I was really enjoying the year cake, right? And I was probably 22 at the time and he was getting a year cake and I was really enjoying his talk. And there's two guys in front of me, this guy beside me goes, boy, you don't want to mess with him. He's a Golden Gloves boxer. Every time I seen that guy, I said, do you think you're a tough guy? Eh? The guy never did nothing to me, right? Nothing. I'm thinking, you think you're a tough guy? I'll take the street to you. Like, I'm building this case with inside of my head based on what somebody told me in the fellowship. Nobody like that here, right? Anybody building cases here? This guy has no clue. He's never done nothing to me. It's just because somebody said this unthoughtful word toward me and based I was pretty ill. So this one time I'm, I'm, I, I relapsed again and then I came back and I was detoxing. I read uh, the traditions and I had a, a, an anxiety attack while reading. When I got started, I used to have bad anxiety attack and I was dry heaving. And there was 200 people at this meeting. And I left the podium and I ran outside and I was trying to catch my breath. And I was sitting there. Out of 200 people, one person came out and put his arm around me and said, Hey, man, it's okay. I got you. I got you. I've been there, done that. We can get through this. You never believe it was that guy. That guy I wouldn't have walked across the street to piss on if he was on fire. Like, I wouldn't have done it like nothing. And this was the first guy out of that meeting with 200 people who put his armor, and he changed something inside of me in regards to the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and the human race. He created that spark of, yes, there maybe is something to this connection that I've always yearned and looked for that I was never able to have, and it came from the person I least expected it. So when I sit here, to f our real purpose is to fit ourselves. Right in step eleven, we'll really talk about that intuitiveness, this kind word, this thing, this something that doesn't make sense to you, but will, will be a life changing event for the people around you or the people you come in contact with. I'm sure this guy has no idea the life changing event he had for me in that moment, but just by doing that, coming outside, taking a chance, and putting his arm around me, and telling me it was going to be okay. Like I'm sure he had no idea whatsoever but it was something inside of him that told him to go do that and he did it and it created a shift inside of me anyways i don't know why i went there with that but that's what they're kind of getting at here right a real purpose go ahead do, do, do. i don't remember where i was uh the question of how to approach the man we hated will arise it may be he has done us more harm than we have done him and though we may be acquired, have acquired a better attitude toward him, we are still not too keen about admitting our faults. Nevertheless, with the person we dislike, we take the bit in our teeth. It is harder to go to an enemy than to a friend, but we find it much more beneficial to us. We go to him in a helpful and forgiving spirit, confessing our former ill feeling and expressing our regret. That's beautiful, eh? Yeah, and you don't use that as an excuse to tell the guy everything you're telling everybody. You ever hear people come up to you? I've had people in the fellowship come up to you. Oh, you know, I'm sorry for telling everybody what an asshole you were. Or I thought you were this. Or th it's not a... <laughs> making amends of somebody isn't an opportunity to tell them everything and feel safe about them. Does that kind of make sense? Like, we, it's yeah, in the general, know, huh? I think you think about them or write out about them. Or tell everybody about them. Like, could you imagine? Hey, People man, do I that. Really, I really want to tell you how I really feel about you. Yeah. And, and we use the amend process as an excuse to to really. And, then, and not only that, we walk away. I feel really good telling you that now. <laughs> and the other person feels like shit. Right? 
Well, how many people did you tell this to? Everybody I know. I thought, I thought, oh my God. And it causes a lot of damage too. I've had some people say stuff about me that I don't know where they got that idea from. Not based on anything because somebody else said something. And a gr small group of people are acting a certain way in regards to something that wasn't based on anything. And treating me in such a manner. And when this guy came and made amends to me for it, he was saying all this nasty stuff. And the more he was talking, the more I was looking at him, I kind of went, you're a real piece of work, aren't you? Right? Like an AA member, right? I couldn't believe this was happening. So when you approach it in a general way, look, based on my self-esteem, my, my personal security, I said things that weren't very net. Well, what did you say? I don't really, I don't feel good about getting into that. I've approached the people I've said that stuff to, and I've taken care of that. I've told them based on my self-esteem, my self-worth, right, my social, my ambitions, and, and based on, you know, I found you a threat or something like that, or the attention people gave you. I didn't like it so much, so I said these these things. I'm sorry, man. I, I really want like to take those things back. And that's what I think they're getting at here, right? But seeking counsel with another person is very, very, very important, right? Right, Joe? Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's good when they actually go and correct it to all the people they've said it to, which doesn't normally happen. Sometimes they just come to you to make the singular amends. Well, my sport. Oh, oh, sorry. We gotta remember, right? Like another thing too here on, on that subject. Like it's, it's really e a lot easier said than done. You know, you gotta. Some people. I'm not gonna take the, the the ownership for people's actions or anything, but we're dealing with a lot of sick people, right? And a demonstration of someone even making the attempt, whether they know how to do it or not, especially if they're new, give them give them the benefit of the doubt. Like even if they are saying a bunch of stuff, if they're new in their first five ten years. And they're still trying to figure out how, because a lot of us, we don't have the human skills. Like I've been to a lot of sorted places on this earth. I've seen a lot of lows. So what I find to be at a level of accepting behavior may be someone's, nope, that ain't coming near me. Right. So that's one of the things that I've learned through sponsorship. Like, Hey, you gotta be easier on some of the people making the approach. You know, this is what they know. This is where they come from. The fact that they're trying is a huge thing, right? So I just, you know, they may not know how to correct that with everybody, but if they're coming up to you doing that, then, you know, you kind, loving, and tolerant, right? Treat other people the way you want to be treated in the same situation. 100%. Well, my sponsor told me that. It kind of makes, so when I show compassion to the people who are seeking my forgiveness, I hope that the people I'm seeking forgiveness from will show me compassion. Same with family. Same with family. This is very tricky with family too, because a lot of us will use the amends thing as a vehicle to repunish people or to bring up stuff that they done. That's not our position to do. With my mom, when I actually did this course of action, I didn't bring up the past anymore. Anytime my mom brought up the past, I said we did good. We we come a long way. We got out of there. I never rehashed the stuff that she's been through or the guilt she carries. But when she was willing to talk to me about that stuff, I kind of said, yeah, were there here? I had forgiveness and healing in those areas, right? A demonstration of this stuff is really huge because a lot of us, when it comes to loved ones, we're very less tolerant, aren't we? We're a little more punishing when it comes to people. It's like we think we have permission to punish them, but when we're, asking, when we're going to for, ask for forgiveness, really we're using it as an excuse to punish them. Same with exes. Anybody have exes here or mother or fathers of your kids and all that other stuff? How do we treat them? That's interesting, isn't it? Eh? It's well, funny how we'll treat a complete stranger. But when it comes to somebody in our circle and our kids, the parents of our kids, our partners and all this, how do we really treat them? How do we conduct ourselves? Isn't that interesting? Eh? I got a little, and I, I want to share something about that too, a little bit of my experience. Like I, I got full custody of my son, my son's mother. He's, she's still out there. She's been out there for a while. Before going through this, I had a very different view of how I viewed her, right? And uh, through good sponsorship, Tony's my sponsor. We walked shoulder to shoulder through this thing. But thanks to his guidance, I was able to see something from another side that I was unable to see, what she's going through, what she's trying to do. So my attitude when I first got sober was like, I don't want you around. Don't come around. I don't care if you're calling. My attitude now, and so a demonstration with my son, is when we go to bed at night, we're praying for her. 
when she makes a call, I, I engage in a, in a different manner with her. I understand that she's doing what she can. She suffers from other disorders, but my view around that has changed. Like, it'll be like, hey, Kara, how you doing? How can I help you out? If she phones sometimes, I don't even understand what she's saying. But for my son, who needs relief from that, he hasn't seen her in a few years. This is where we start building a new story with with her. And I get a little bit of relief. He gets that relief because when we throw her in the prayers, my son starts to build something that even though it's not there physically, the emotion with it's there. He's still thinking of her. He's still So I wouldn't have implemented that because of my resentment towards her. But after a good sponsorship and seeing that, that's a part of it, right? So that's and that's growth, and that's that's thanks to this process. Yeah. And so, what? Oh, one second. So one one of the things, yeah, I'll put it. Oh, okay here. <laughs> <laughs> My wife got me minzo soup. I haven't eaten all day. Okay, thank you, honey. <laughs> okay, so. So one, one of the things is we'll kind of go over this real fast because you should seek counsel with, with another human being. And I want to revisit this, what we're talking about here, how our conduct toward people. Because it's easy to, when it's about these areas. So on page, they talked about, we on page 78, they talk about most alcoholics owe money. So you want to read that and it kind of gives you an idea on how to approach that. And then they go in, perhaps we've committed a criminal offense. You don't do a fifth step from the podium and you don't let everybody know what you've done. There's a statute of limitations on some things and some things don't have a statute of limitations. You want to keep your mouth shut in a meeting. Just because you're in a meeting, not everybody, hey, I got warrants for my arrest or I haven't done this. <laughs> don't be surprised if there's somebody waiting for you when you leave the meeting. You know, don't, like, you know, like, you get what I'm saying? Like some people, I had one guy up at a podium talking about all the stuff. He's doing a fifth step. I said, well, buddy, after the meeting, I said, maybe you want to refrain from talking about that other group of people when you're in this group of people because it may cause a conflict within your life because you don't know who's in the meeting, right? RCMP, cops sitting there, and you're doing a fifth step. Well, good for you. Have <laughs> I wonder how they caught me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and you're talking about your girlfriend, you're still with your wife, like, like you know, in a general way, right? <laughs> so then they talk about here, perhaps, okay, 79. Then they talk about here, about reemphasizing what this is about. Reminding. You want to hit us up with that? You see where it says reminding on page 79? Yeah, I've got it underlined. Oh, yeah. Reminding reminding ourselves that we have decided to go to any lengths to find a spiritual experience. So remember yeah. what they talked about that and how it works, right? Willing to go to any lengths. Reminding ourselves of the contract we made in step three. We thought well before taking a step. This is where the rubber hits the road. Reminding ourselves we haven't had the spiritual experience your spiritual awakening yet we're feeling good but we're a long way from getting better remember what they talked about in the spiritual appendix sometimes it'll take a few months to bring about this psychic change or spiritual experience it doesn't happen overnight and if it does happen overnight we need to find a way to maintain and keep it right we're just starting on this road we're going to feel really good we'll find a connection starting to happen but as far as an actual psychic change or spiritual experience and not regretting the past and i wish to shut the door on it i know people who've gone eight days this thing eight i'm eight days sober now i've recovered i'd hold off on that right are you at peace with the, your past or you've made amends to all these people are you okay you sleep comfortably is your pillow a good friend Right, when, when, like you know what I mean? Are you okay when you're left with you alone? When you say recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body, are you at peace? And if you're still having to remind yourself and you're plagued with things from the past or the potential of the future, I would say there's some spiritual work that still needs to be done. Anybody kind of concur that? Yeah. So now you get to see where your thinking is because you have the ability to kind of, uh, um, to kind of meditate you're, you're more in tune to what's actually happening in the moment right so find the spiritual experience go ahead we ask that we be given strength and direction to do the right thing no what, matter what the personal consequences may be what step does that sound like
What step does that sound like? 11. Yeah, because we're asking for strength and direction. So that means when we get jammed in with our thinking, we're going to apply all the principles we learned in four that we got relief to seek power, right? So it's kind of reminding us when we hit these troublesome times in our nines uh, from the list that we have be, as we go out to make these things, we're struggling, we should be doing step 11, we should have this prayer. We should have this 24-hour clock at work in our lives here, right? So then they talk about here. Uh, then they talk about, let's go to page 80. Page 80. So then they talk about here again, if. If. Page 80. Right at the top. Before taking drastic situations, let's go with that. we have obtained permission, have consulted with others, ask God to help, and the drastic step is indicated, we must not shrink. So they're talking about situations that involve other people. Again, you want to read that and go over it with your sponsor. We're not going to sit here and give you counsel on that. That's between you, your sponsor, and the people around you. They'll give you an indication on how to approach or practice these principles through here, right? So a lot of times here is a lot of people will hear something and they'll go take action on it. And that's not what we're saying at all. You should be in counsel with somebody who has the practical experience of going through this. If somebody hasn't gone through what you're about to go through, find somebody who has. It's sharing our experience, strength, and hope, not our ideas and our opinions. Right? Like with my background, I found people who went through the things that I went through and were able to deal with it and gave me counsel on how to pursue these things. I didn't get information. It's like back in, in when you're in jail, you hear a lot of guys say, hey, I got a great lawyer. Use my lawyer. Well, what are you still doing in jail? <laughs> well, I only got 30 days, bro. Yeah, so, so you know, if you're still in jail, well, I want a lawyer that's kind of... And so seeking counsel would be our, our biggest aim here. So what they talk about here... Ask God. Hey, Tony, I like the one that Tony uses this one in Vancouver at the study, but it's like, could you imagine if you went up to a stranger? Because that's what it's like if you try to go get an opinion and you're telling them something and they don't have that experience of what you've done. And then could you picture what they're thinking? Right? So we go out and get drastic opinions. So we avoid doing that, right? Usually, like Tony's saying, his background, he talked to somebody in that, in that particular game, right? Some of you, some of you may be in a professional situation where you know you're cops or, or you're just you talk to somebody in that profession dealing with that certain circumstance, right? Along those lines, one one hundred percent because there's no short of a bad advice in AA. Anybody ever notice that? <laughs> you don't need people have no experience, no business whatsoever saying giving people advice or opinions. Is share our experience, strength, and hope on how we applied spiritual principles. To overcome, to get through this situation. To get through it, right? It's like walking through a paint shop. You're going to get paint on you. How much paint you get on you will determine how you walk through the paint shop. So you get somebody to navigate you through it and you usually do pretty good, right? So let's go down here. We're going to hit up on page uh, 83. I want to hit these ideas here. Well, let's go with our page 80, 81. Hang they just on, finished. I'm rolling. What, what part? I'll, I'll read it, Kim. Kim, she's getting rid of somebody. Okay, so the chances are we have domestic problems. Anybody here have domestic problems? Anybody? Nobody? Anybody have exes that are still around? Anybody have parents, people, domestic, like people, intimate relationships? Domestic doesn't have to be with a sexual, it could be anybody in, on an intimate basis. Anybody have to deal, anybody separated with kids that they have to co, right? Anybody, those situations, kind of parents, situate on and on and on. So when there's emotional attachment involved in a relationship, you notice it's a lot different how we treat people. You ever notice that? Yeah. Some of us are very vicious when it comes to people that we love and care about. Compared to people who just acquaintances or people like that. We just disregard whatever. So a lot of the amends will be pretty simple. Because they're really, whatever. 
not a lot of emotional attachment to it. But the ones that have a lot of emotional attachment to it, grandparents, parents, kids, neighbors, loved ones, anybody find those a lot harder? And even the idea of thinking about those things? And anybody ever try to talk to somebody with, with an emotional connection and realize you start off with a simple conversation and all hell breaks loose? It goes to shit in a handbasket like, like that? It's too like too both of you step on both both of you step on a landmine at the same time. How many people have those kind of relationships? Okay, so let's go. The chances. The chances are that we have domestic troubles. Perhaps we are mixed up with women in a fashion we wouldn't care to have advertised. We doubt if, in this respect, alcoholics are fundamentally much worse than other people. But drinking does complicate sex relations in the home. <laughs> you think? <laughs> Especially when you wake up in somebody else's home thinking it's your home. <laughs> Nobody in this crowd, eh? <laughs> After a few years with an alcoholic, a wife gets worn out, resentful, and uncommunicative. How could she be anything else? The husband begins to feel lonely, sorry for himself. He commences to look around in the nightclubs or their equivalent for something besides liquor. Perhaps he is having a secret and exciting affair with the girl who understands. This could go either way, male, female, and nowadays male, male, female, female, whatever, we're 2020, whatever floats your boat, right? Okay. Perhaps he is having a secret and a fighting signing fair with the girl who understands. In fairness, we must say that she may understand. But what are we going to do about a thing like that? A man so involved often feels very remorseful at times, especially if he is married to a loyal and courageous girl who has literally gone through hell for him. So what 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 was the warning back in our fourth if our conduct continues to hurt other people and ourselves, what's usually the outcome with these kind of relationships and situations? We're sure to drink again. We get loaded again. And a lot of people, they don't get honest in these areas about the secretive of conduct that they're engaged in. And it doesn't necessarily have to be with other people. Conduct. Conduct that they're engaged in that they don't want to bring to the surface or share with other people or make right or correct. Right, that cuts us off from the sunlight of the spirit, and we get loaded again. So this is a very troublesome area, right? This is like, probably, yeah. Anyways, okay. Whatever the situation, we usually have to do something about it. If we are sure our wife does not know, should we tell her? Not always, we think. If she knows in a general way that we have been wild, should we tell her in detail? Undoubtedly, we should admit our fault. She may insist on knowing all the particulars. She will want to know who the woman is and where she is. Yeah, with a shotgun, she'll want to know. <laughs> where is she? No, I'm just having fun. Never mind. <laughs> I've never done anything like that. We feel we ought to say to her that we have no right to involve another person. We are sorry for what we have done, and God willing, it shall not be repeated. I was, with, than... I was, I was with my sponsee, and, and he was on his deathbed. And, and uh, he was talking to his, his wife, and, and he felt that he needed to make some amends to her. And he says, you know, honey, he says, I want to clear up some things. He says, you know, that, that's... You know, you were really suspicious of that neighbor. She, he says, I did have a relationship with her. She goes, I know, honey, just just relax. I love you. Just relax. Okay. He says, well, this went really good, Tony. I said, no, I, I just kind of take it easy, buddy. He says, no, no, no. He says, remember you were kind of, you are thinking about me and your cousin? And she goes, yes, yes, I know about that too. It's okay, honey. Just relax. Take it easy. And he's going, well, this is going really good. And remember about your sister-in-law? Yeah, yeah, I know that about that too. Just relax. And and your sister, you know, that was true. He, she goes, I know. Just sit, relax, and let the poison take effect. Just sit, relax, and take it easy. Okay, sir. <laughs> okay. So be careful how you make amends. <laughs> 
Just let the poison work. <laughs> okay. Our design. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> it's not a true story. Okay, just some years. Oh my god. Okay. We're not finishing that chapter? Sure, finish it. Okay. Uh we are sorry for what we have done and God willing it shall not be repeated. More than that we cannot do. We have no right to go further. Though there may be justifiable exceptions, and though we wish to lay down no rule of any sort, we have often found this to be the best course to take. Again, again, find somebody who's been there, done that. Yeah. Don't, don't get advice from people that haven't been there and done that. It's the worst thing you can do. Believe me. One of those, and I'll add to that, there was something in my five that I left out, you know, and it was one of those things where um, just really, my sponsor at the time, the guy who took me through this, uh, I just didn't feel that that experience was, I was able to have that. I heard Tony mention something like that in the meeting one time. I then went, was able to talk about that freely because he's had that experience. Does that make sense? So that's one of those things there. I just thought, I'd, you know, one of those, you're holding on and it's got to come out, but it's like to an understanding closed mouth friend, right? Thanks. Thanks. Our design for living is not a one way street. It is as good for the wife as for the husband. If we can. <laughs> you know yeah. what that means, eh? So when she starts apologizing, you show the same love and kindness and, and concern. It's funny. When we're looking for, like, somebody to forgive us, we're all like, oh, please. But when we, we're asked of the same thing, we're a little different, right? What do you mean you fooled around on me? <laughs> Anyways, we're funny. It is better, however, that one does not needlessly name a person whom she can vent jealously. Jealousy. Perhaps there are some cases where the utmost frankness is demanded. No outsider can appraise such an intimate situation. It may be that both will decide that the way of good sense and loving kindness is to let bygones be bygones. More, 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 more cases than that. Ninety-eight percent of the time, usually kills a relationship. In today's day. In today's day, back then it was a lot different, lot different era, right? A lot, a lot like this is an area that we really want to have a sane and sound idea for the future, right? Eh? Why? Okay. Well, why would you? Why would we say that today? Well, a lot, a lot of people are in relationships that shouldn't be in relationships. I don't want to be in a relationship, but they think they should be. And what happens is, is they kind of, uh, uh, well, this is kind of like they act single in a relationship. Right. Yep. Right. I don't know anybody. You know people that act single in a relationship, and then what happens? It causes a lot of pain, hurt, agony. And pain to everybody else. So you create, you're still lying. And you're hurting people. You don't want a, anybody to have somebody that you're with. But you don't want to be with just that person. So we create these illusions. These lies. These misconceptions. These these kind of. These uh, uh, really. like I think. I don't know if we're more trouble today. Than we were back then. But they're sure a lot in, more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess that's a nice way of saying it, right? Because a lot of us in this area here, we're really, and when it comes to relationships, we're a really difficult area. Right. And it was more taboo back in this day to get divorced than it is now. Yeah. It's so accepted now. Each might pray about it, having the other one's happiness uppermost in mind. Keep it always in sight that we are dealing with that most terrible human emotion, jealousy. Good generalship may decide that the problem be attacked on the flank rather than risk a face-to-face -face combat. If we, have snaps, if we have no such complication, there is plenty we should do at home. Sometimes we hear an alcoholic say that the only thing he needs to do is to keep sober. Certainly he must keep sober, for there will be no home if he doesn't. But he is yet a long way from making good to the wife or parents whom for years he has so shockingly treated. 
years. Not, like it takes away from the pressure of thinking a couple days, years, years. We're talking a demonstration of this later on. And I think in, in one of the chapters says it takes years to tear down the old structures to build new ones in its place. This kind of gives you the kind of relax a bit. Like you're just starting this road. Your first five years, you're on a spiritual apprenticeship here. First five years, you're a newcomer. Joe, first 10. First 20 for me. I'm really sick. Like, like really bad. Thanks for letting me speak tonight, guys. I don't get that privilege often. <laughs> <laughs> Is that all you wanted to say? No, I got some more, but it's later. Okay. <laughs> hey, thanks again, though. Okay, you're welcome. Go ahead, Kim. <laughs> Thank you. Passing all understanding is the patience mothers and wives have had with alcoholics. Had this not been so, many of us would have had no homes today or perhaps be dead. The alcoholic is like a tornado roaring his way through the lives of others. Hearts are broken, sweet relationships are dead, affections have been uprooted, selfish and inconsiderate habits have kept the home in turmoil. We feel a man is unthinking when he says that sobriety is enough. He is like the farmer who came up from his cyclone cellar to find his home ruined. To his wife, he remarked, don't see anything the matter here, ma. Ain't it grand the wind stopped blowing? Yes, there is a long period of reconstruction ahead. We must take the lead. A remorseful mumbling that we are sorry won't fill, fit, fill the bill at all. We ought to sit down with the family and frankly analyze the past as we now see it, being careful not to criticize them. Their defects may be glaring, but the chances are that our own actions are partly responsible. So every once in a while, the wife and I will sit down and we'll have, we'll review our, where we're at and where we're going in our relationship. And some of the areas that might be a little troublesome, right? Be it financial or maybe the way I, um, uh, my agitation in certain areas or my kind of absent-mindedness with certain things or I'm not meeting my certain responsibilities. And we, we kind of touch on those things. My wife doesn't have any of those problems because she's perfect. I love her. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> And the better I do, the happier she is, right? But no, we review this idea. We sit down and we kind of analyze where we're at and where we're going and how we can improve our relationship. It's, and that comes from the idea that we got from our fourth step, right? You already have this idea when you're sitting down with your partner, where you're at, what got you there, right? And where you want to go. So if you're becoming this person, they will start to change as time goes on. If you're not biting on to the, the baits and the emotional traps and, and right, anybody, the landmines, if you're not stepping on the landmines anymore and you're refraining from, from the energy becoming present with inside of yourself, and you're taking care of this, this emotional deformities with inside of you, which we understand is step six now. If you're still carrying that stuff and it starts to dissipate as time goes on, your relationship will improve if you both get on, on track. But you starting to tell your partner now how to start, they should start conducting themselves and how they should live their life after you've been such a shit show for so long. Now you're going to tell them how to live their life? Come on, really? That's what they're kind of saying here. Easy, easy on the people around you, right? We're happy you're three months sober again and you put it on your resume, but people have been helping you for years now. Just easy on them. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> So we clean house with the family, asking each morning in meditation that our creator show us the way of patience, tolerance, kindness, and love. What step does that look like again? Eleven. So what steps should we be doing as we're cleaning up the past? Eleven. 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 Because cleaning up the past without eleven, how would you start looking? You start creating the damage that created the damage. Right, because you're going in unsupervised. You're going on on an instinct based, 
then you are spiritual based. When you're spiritually based, you're more in tune with your energy. Anybody ever notice that? You're in, more in tune with what's happening inside of you. When you go more instinct based, you're already fear based, so you're shut off from that energy. You're more fight or flight responsive. You remember, anybody watch The Matrix here? Remember before he got introduced to that, he was on South, he didn't really know. He had a feeling it was there, but didn't quite know. And once he came to see, believe, and practiced it, he became Neo, like just tapped right in. That's what we're talking about here. Just to give it a more modern kind of feel if you've seen the movie. But, you know, you're more highly aware of things that are more realistic than if they were delusional. Right? Yeah, it's... it's, it's, it's I laugh sometimes because sometimes I get that emotional energy and I see me putting my fist through the wall. But I give no indication that I'm going to do that. I don't know how to explain that. Where that was something I would do 31 years ago, I'd put my fist right through the wall to create dominance within my home. I understand that now as I've been to anger management twice. I failed the first time. Yeah, whatever. So anyways, <laughs> so... So that was like an early sobriety, right? I didn't know that slamming doors and all that stuff was a form of intimidation and communication. Neanderthal communication, right? And I'm 240 pounds, six foot two. I'm intimidating as it is. So now when I get angry, the people around me is like, ah, my loved ones, right? Relation people I'm in a relationship with by doing that stuff. So I'd create a, a, an environment of intimidation and fear thinking it was harmony and love. But once I got in tune to that stuff, doesn't mean all that those ideas or those feelings go away. It means that they're not governing my life anymore because I'm a little defective still. But as long as I keep spiritually fit, th that guy doesn't show up again. If I'm not spiritually fit, guess who shows up? Him, because he's always there. Yeah, the guy in my four step, the Neanderthal shows up. Okay. Okay. The spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. Unless one's family expresses a desire to live upon spiritual principles, we think we ought not to urge them. We should not talk incessantly to them about spiritual matters. <laughs> Do they know the audience or what, eh? Do we like talk to incessantly to other people now that we're spiritual? Well, acceptance, surrender. You know, if you had more God in your life, you could be as in harmony as I am. <laughs> Imagine sitting... How many people sat with their loved ones talking shit like that? Yeah. Come on. Well, you know, I know myself so better now. Maybe I'll give you some treatment ideas on how to work with yourself because it seems like you still have some attachment and some codependency. I can help you work through these things now that I'm out of treatment for two weeks. I got a certificate. I'm so I'm qualified to work with you. I'm a counselor. I'm a counselor. We should all walk around for our first five years. I am not a counselor. Don't ask me for advice. <laughs> I'm sorry. But we're good, eh? Huh? Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. They will change in time. Our behavior will convince them more than our words. We must remember that 10 or 20 years of drunkenness would make a skeptic out of anyone. See, I see what I love about how they've emphasized time here, how it's taking time here. And you see a lot of like 12 steps, 12 hours, eight day boot camps, 12 day boot camps, recovered in 30 days. The, in this solution, they don't feed you no delusion of time. They, they're very straight up about it and, and the repair and, and the, constant uh, consistency of, of applying this right and that's what i love about it is how they time. how many people here know people that conduct themselves in a certain way and they say they don't want to do that but you're waiting for them to do it again hmm. loved ones people you know somebody anybody have that in the back and you just wait and you know it's just a matter of time before they do it again now we are okay with that thinking, but when somebody has that thinking with us, we feel unjustified with it. What do you mean you're thinking that I'm going to? It's the same shoe, right? So somebody else is viewing us with it now. We could view other people, but when they view us with it, and they kind of, you know, like you're a couple months sober now, and they're still walking up close to you to get a smell, or to see if any of the tinfoil's missing from the living room, 
I mean, from the kitchen, like there's still that that assessment. Yeah. You get up to go to the bathroom. Where are you going? <laughs> yeah, you coming back? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but when I first got when I first got sober, my mom still followed me to every room in her house, and she did that for about nine months. My my mom, I was three years sober before she got a bar in her house. A bar. A like bar, a, a bar, a bar, like an alcohol bar. Oh. Right? She, when I said, I said, what's this? She says, it's a bar. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> go, go ahead. There may be some wrongs we can never fully right. We don't worry about them if we can honestly say to ourselves that we would right them if we could. So this is not meant to be an excuse, and especially you're thinking to say, "Well, yeah, I could if I, you know." But they're 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 a new Westminster, like, and for us, that's like twenty k away, right? You know what I mean? Like, ah, it's just too far. It's not meant to be used as an excuse. I've heard it many times used as an excuse to avoid this. So I'm just wanted to emphasize it. Some people cannot be seen. We send them an honest letter. And there may be a valid reason for postponement in some cases, but we don't delay if it can be avoided. We should be sensible, tactful, considerate, and humble without being servile or scraping. As God's people, we stand on our feet. We don't crawl before anyone. So where they say there are some wrongs we can never fully right, we don't worry about them if we can honestly say to ourselves that we would write them if we could. That's counsel with another human being, not a whole bunch of people, people who understand where you're going through. Back with my lifestyle that I came um, out from Toronto from, out here to start a new life in, in Vancouver, there was a lot of situations. I couldn't go back to the people that I was involved. It was just part of the lifestyle or some of the things that I was doing or some of the things that I was I was. I was involved in, I couldn't go back to make right those situations. So my sponsor said, what you do is pass that forward, right? That means every time you see the mailbox kicked over, remember those harms that we made, that list of harms that we made of people, places, and things? Every time you see the mailbox pick, kicked over, you picked one up. Every time you've seen somebody in discomfort, you try to create comfort. Every time you create havoc in situations, you try to bring peace. Like that best, one of the best prayers is in, in the step 11 and the 12 and 12, right? Is that, is that idea, right? Where you don't bring intimidation and fear. You don't get angry. You kind of keep things at a minimum. Like based on the lifestyle I came from, I took care of all the legal stuff and, and, and all the warrants and all that other stuff. But the people I was involved in, I just stayed away from those situations. I had to. I couldn't go back to those those uh, um, uh, affiliations, and just I just moved on with my life, right. And if I was to see anybody from that past, they would see where I am, and they'd be happy before me. I don't know how else to explain that. And there's some people based in situations uh, I can't go back and make right. I would if I could, but I can't. I need to leave it alone. That's the best thing I can do for them, me, and the world around me because I sought counsel with another human being. So what does that mean? I pass it forward. Some of those those bank uh, so, uh, quiet. Some of those things I was involved in were involved money that I can't return back to those situations. What I do is I have a list of the amends. I pass that money forward to other situations. When, when back when I was supposed to pay support in different situation, I was unable to do that for different reasons. I made right, but now in the future, when I was making them, there are single parents that I would help anonymously or money I'll donate to different things. When I smash this picture window or I ruin this car, or ruin it, I kind of get a, a figure on what that is and I give money to different places or somebody that's going through a hard time with no money or no situation or they need a damage deposit because somebody wrecked or done something to their car, I'll give them anonymously the damage deposit or help them with a basket or a food basket anonymously so I don't get no credit from it. Or I get somebody else to give them the money anonymously. And I say, don't say, that takes care of those items. 
So okay. I got another 50 years, I should be even. I'm 31 years sober now. Another 50, I should, the slate should be clean. 50 more years. Yeah. yeah. I just keep buying big books because I stole my big book. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> I have a bunch to give away if anyone needs one. If we are painstaking okay, about so the phase of our development. What we're going to do is this week, yeah. read. Re, you guys read the promises and see what it leads into. And you're going to read, read not what people taught you. Read what it says. And read page 84 to 85. And stop at the bottom of 85. And read what it's saying. Pretend nobody's ever taught you anything. Pretend you got this book in the mail and you're looking at it for the first time and you finished it. You just read through your men's. You got all these different approaches and these ideas to these different items that are on your list. You're going to seek counsel with other people. Now they're going to introduce you for the first time. You're going to read this if and you're going to read through the rest of it. And then we're going to go through it the way the book's laid out. And to see if you kind of get what the book's saying compared to what people have been telling you what it says all these years. And see if it's the same thing. Because this is going to be a real game changer as we go through this. Was, was that kind of clear? Everybody got an okay with that? Put your hand up. Everybody? Right on. Okay, Kim. What, what, Joe, did you want to put an announcement out there? Or? Yeah, I uh... I hope you guys like that. We uh, we do record these if you miss anything. We put them up on our YouTube channel. Um, the channel is Tony R. Vancouver. I put it up in the chat. Um, we have uh, some of my sponsors have been posting up their emails um, to uh, acquire the big book study sheets that we have. And um, we have a Facebook page. It's called the Big Book Discussion page. Uh, you can... You can uh, add us on there we only discuss uh things in regards to the big book we don't post our cakes and stuff like that we'll we'll, 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 we'll do that but it's not really it's a different kind of book-based page um other than that uh kim you want to you want to talk about the uh, seventh thing the seventh tradition states that alcoholics anonymous be self-supporting through our own contributions um, our contributions help cover this group's expenses, which are Zoom membership, but they also help cover our obligations in real life. Um, even though we are not mis meeting physically, we do still have to pay the rent for the room we normally work in um, at the Alano Club. Uh, and so any donations are appreciated. I put it, post the PayPal in the link. Um, I was speaking to um, our uh, Tradition 8 worker at our local central office today. And our local central office here in Vancouver needs assistance. So if you are in British Columbia, please uh, check out the local Vancouver central office website. If you are local to yourselves, go to your local um, central office or your area intergroup um, and make a one-time donation or encourage your home groups that are not meeting to make their seventh split. Um, now is the month when these organizations are running out of money. Um, this meeting, the parent meeting, made a $1,500 don dollar donation to central office, um, but that was used up almost immediately to pay bills, um, and they are needing money. So please, please keep that in mind if you can. I know a lot of us aren't working and money is tight, but, you know, $5 from everyone could make a big difference to keep AA moving because there's um, salaries to be paid, rent to be paid, literature going out. The phones are running. The lights have to stay on. They need Wi-Fi. Um, so, yeah, just please keep that in consideration and, and take a peek into donating locally if you don't want to donate to us. Um, but any and all donations in any form are, are very much appreciated because uh, the plea is out to, to please donate to AA. And we, I forgot to mention, too, also thank you. We, all, we meet here every Tuesday and Thursday. And uh, when we do open up again, uh, we haven't discussed it yet. We'll, we'll look into it. We'll be doing it live from the Vancouver Alano. But uh, that those dates, we'll, we'll get back to it. But until then, we're here because i got a couple people asking. We'll, we'll, we'll be picking up where we left off Tuesday, 6, 6 p.m., and, uh, and we'll just keep going. And again, if you missed out, YouTube, subscribe. Hit the bell next to the subscription. You'll get the no notifications for every talk from here on out right away. 
Yeah. And, and it's worth to note because a lot of you aren't in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Like our restrictions are being lifted and we're doing everything we can to keep bringing everyone in North America this format of AA. Um, so we're doing our best to keep this going because even though we're going to be allowed out of our homes, we understand not everybody is right now. Um, so both the night and the morning meetings as well are continuing. We we're doing training this week, but the big book, we're working on a contingent plan to keep it going for you guys. So 